Uh, Billy Graham once said, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in society. And this is very true. It's not only something that's unsung and unpraised and unnoticed in our society, but many fathers themselves, we feel a little bit like, uh, don't put the spotlight on me. Because I don't know about you, I'm, I've been a dad long enough that as soon as I hear Happy Father's Day and how important it is to be a father, all of a sudden I start feeling all of this guilt about the failures um, that I've experienced as a father. And I, I want to encourage you with that. You know, being a father is not about um, uh, your performance record. And the most important thing we can do as dads is to be there, be available. Um, and some of us, you know, the, the ways in which we connect with our kids... Uh, maybe we've been alienated from our kids. We find our kids aren't reaching out to us. Um, I, I understand that. I'm not going to see my kids today, um, and I feel a little bit like a failure about that. But my job is to be available. My job is to be there, to be open, um, to be present as much as I can. And I just want to encourage you with that. Just be available. Just be there. Okay? Yeah? All right. So we're going to begin our message today. We're going to be talking about being rooted in routine, rooted in routine. Uh, about three weeks ago, we went and visited the campus of the University of Cincinnati. My daughter is looking for a, church, uh, for a college to go to, and uh, she wanted to see what UC was like. And so we went down there. My son already goes to UC, so we traveled around the campus, and then we went and got lunch. And, you know, we like to try different restaurants down in Cincinnati, and I wanted to try Taft's Brewhouse. Anybody been to Taft's Brewhouse? No? Okay, it's just me. Okay, I guess, I don't know. I wanted to go there for a while because I personally am a craft beer enthusiast. Uh, my wife calls me a beer snob, but that's what I am. And also, Taft's is in an old church building that's been renovated. Um, which is kind of cool. You go there and you got all the stained glass windows. And I love church architecture and all this kind of stuff. So I had a good time. But the fact that Tass did this, that they took an old church that has become unoccupied and turned it into something, isn't really unusual. It's happening a lot now. If you go down to Dayton, you go to the Oregon district, there's two churches. One has been turned into a personal residence. And the other one is a, a rock climbing uh, place. It's called the Urban Crag. Anybody been there? couple people, okay. If you go to Troy, the one of the main churches on Main Street has also been turned into Moeller Brew Barn. So this is a thing. It's a thing. We're taking churches that are now out of business, and we're turning them to other things. And people do this because they like the church architecture. It's local. It's cool. Um, and they, you know, want to have that experience. But of course, this is also a symbol of something else, something that's happening in the United States, right? That uh, churches are becoming more abandoned, right? Now, we tell the story uh, like this, that, that America is becoming less Christian or post-Christian or whatever you want to call it. And that might be part of the story. I'm not going to deny that. Less people are identifying themselves as Christians. But I think it's more than that, because what it actually involves, and a big part of it, is this. It's not that people have been walking away from their faith. not that people have been saying, oh, I don't care about Jesus. I'm just going to go live my life, or I'm abandoning my beliefs in Jesus. No. Many, many, many Christians just have decided that church isn't important. They've decided they've got other things to do. And over time, of course, that has its impact on churches, right? It's really a story not so much just about American culture, but it's a, uh, also a story about what's happening to Christians in our country, how we're changing our values, our beliefs, our ideas. Um, I, I, I was talking to Randy a few uh, months ago um, about what preaching was like in the 70s and 80s. You know, you get some perspective when you talk to a man like Randy. And he's like, oh, you kids. You know, he pulled the, I walked, I had to walk uh, to school both ways, naked in the snow. Or, uh, you know, uh, he said, we had to preach three sermons a week. We had Sunday morning, and then you came back Sunday night, and then you went Wednesday as well, three times a week. Anybody remember that? Yeah, some of us remember that, right? 
yeah, that's true. And then as time went on, you know, you kind of hit the 90s, the 80s and the 90s, and then, you know, maybe it was just once a week, right? Now, you know, people maybe come once, twice a month, and they say, this is my, I'm a regular attender. I come once, twice a month. I wonder what's going to happen in 10 years. I mean, are we, are we in some ways isolated or different from the churches that are gone out of business? Are we somehow different? It's a good question, right? It's a good question. What kind, of, what kind of surprises me about this or what alarms me about it is people seem to be coming to church less, but we put so much more work and effort when you're here to give you the best experience you possibly could have, right? I mean, this worship team is so talented, right? Like, they're amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, you go to any band out in Dayton, and you're not going to get what you get here, right? I'm telling you, like, these guys are amazing, right? And I I have to say this. The preaching's not bad either, is it? (laughs) Right? Well, yeah. I mean... I grew up, I had to go to church in the 80s, and I remember what it was like. I mean, it was pretty boring, right? It was pretty boring. But we all went. We went every week. And now, we put all of this effort into making this the best possible show. And we think, eh, we could do something else. What's happened? What's happened to our attitude about church? What's happened about how we think church is important? Do we find it important at all anymore? Why did you come to church today? Do you believe it's important? I mean, you're here, but how important is it really? I went. I was asking people last couple weeks, you know, about this question. You know, why do people seem to just think that church is less important? They say, well, there's just so many other things. This is one of the things. Says, We're just so busy today. Yeah, that's true. There's so many other things to do on Sunday, right? That was another reason given. But I do think it has something to do with just our basic assumptions about what's important in life. I want to bring this up because we are studying what it means to live a life filled with the Holy Spirit, the holy wind and the holy fire of God. And we're looking at that through the lens of the first few years in the life of the church. And it's pretty amazing things happen. God breathes his Holy Spirit on his people and they're spirit-led in ways that just, I mean, are kind of revolutionary. It's pretty amazing. We've been looking at some of this stuff, right? It says in Acts 2, 42 through 45, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles and all who believed were together. They had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and dividing them all to anyone who had need. I mean, this is an amazing group of people. And then if you follow the book of Acts, I mean, they, they, they do such, such astounding things. Peter and Paul, I mean, they stand up to kings. They travel the world. They change cities. I mean, there was one, there, there was, there was one governor who said, you followers of Jesus have turned the world upside down. How could they do such a thing? Well, let's look at Acts 2.46. They divided things among to anyone who had need, and every day they met together in the temple. If it, your eyes might just glance over this verse as if it's just an insignificant detail, but I don't think so. I think there's a connection between the way in which the Spirit revived them, changed their hearts and minds, empowered them to impact the world, and these simple routines of meeting together in the temple. 
I mean, the temple, I mean, that's a place of old time religion. That's a place of traditions and customs and all that stuff that you and I are like, oh, well, if you're going to be spirit led, you know, I mean, routine, ritual, tradition, religion, has nothing to do with that. But we see here, they didn't abandon the temple. They didn't abandon all the old customs. They kept meeting together in that place. I don't think, that the, I don't think it's by accident that there's some connection between this and the way in which the Spirit moved in their lives. They met in this place of religious tradition every day. I think it's the fact that they were rooted in these holy routines that created the space within them for them to become the kind of people that they became. Routine isn't, it is not the enemy of a spirit-led life. Routine is the roots of a spirit-led life. It's the roots. I mean, you see this. You know, you know, there's the Ten Commandments. You guys know the Ten Commandments, right? I'm calling the Big Ten. They're important, right? This is the Big Ten. I mean, you got important stuff in there, right? Like, thou shalt not kill. That's a big deal. Thou shalt not steal. That's a big deal. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's a big deal. But you know what's one of the ten? And in fact, it's the, the, the most words given the most space given, the most attention given in the Big Ten. Let me read it to you. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor male nor female servant nor your animals nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Why is this such a big deal? Why is this one of the big 10? Why is this given the most real estate in the big 10? I think it's because the Lord knows that we human beings are people of routine. Routine is make us, makes us who we are. You know, I wake up every morning and I immediately go into my routine. I wake up, I groan. That's the first part of my routine, right? I do this and I shuffle to the bathroom, okay? I brush my teeth, take a shower, clean myself up. I go back, I find my wife, I give her a kiss and I say, I love you. And I know that throughout that day, I'm, I'm going to have a million different feelings and thoughts. A million different ideas are going to pass through my mind. But those routines, those are actually what keep me on track. Those routines are actually what makes me who I am. You know, the thoughts and the feelings, I mean, they come and go. You have ups and downs. You want to do one thing one time and something else the next. But you change the routines, you change the person. You change the routines, you change the person. Routines are our roots. They make us who we are. My son started playing tennis um, just a couple of months ago. And I, I, I'm using those words specifically. He's playing tennis. He's playing tennis. He's not a tennis player. And he's not a tennis player not because he doesn't have the skills or the abilities. He's not a tennis player because he hasn't entered into the routine enough for it to become who he is, you see? I'm a guitar player, okay? I don't just play guitar, I'm a guitar player. And the reason why I'm a guitar player is not just because I have the skills to pay the bills, although I do have some skills to pay the bills. <laughs> It's because I spent enough time in the routine that has become who I am, right? I am not a basketball player, nor will I ever be. But if I put myself, planted those things, if that was important enough to me that I entered into those routines, you see, 
I'd become something that I am not today. Routines are like that. They are roots. They make us who we are. In fact, they're probably the most important things that define who we are. Change a routine, you change a person. Over time, you become someone else. I just finished a book, and part of the book was rehearsing, or not, I'm sorry, rehearsing, but giving the history of the Soviet Union and the way in which the Soviet government sought to obliterate faith from the people of the society, the, out of the conscious of what we call the religious conscience of the Soviet people. And they tried all different kinds of tactics. They, had a, they, they, they tried for 100 years to obliterate faith from the hearts and the minds of the Russian people. And they tried all kinds of things. They tried propaganda. They tried, you know, mocking Christ and mocking the religious authorities, mocking the church. They tried intimidation. They tried downright suppression and even the danger of death, death camps, things like that. They had marginal success. But you know what was the most successful thing about their campaign they learned? Just change people's routines. So one Christmas, they said, we're not offering Christmas trees. We're going to give you a substitute. And then they began to offer other things, special, special festivals for people during what was the customary religious holidays, you know, Christmas and Easter. We're going to find some really exciting things for people to do other than go to church. And then on Sundays, Sundays we're going to work hard to have all kinds of other things that people can do. That's what worked. Because you retain, you change the routine, you change the people. Over time, you change the routine, you change the people. And I really do thank the Lord that we don't live in a country that's actively seeking to obliterate the church in the way that the Soviet government was seeking to do that. But our routines are changing too. We don't need persecution. We just need temptation. So many other wonderful things to do, places to be, activities to belong to. You change the routine, you change the people. This is the way that we are. Routines, they're our roots. My wife and I are gardening. I mean, my wife is, I mean, it's taking over my life. I have to admit it. It's taking over my life. Each time her, her garden empire just grows every year, right? And I get, I, get, I get pulled into it. But as part of it, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about gardening. I'm learning about plants. I'm learning about all this kind of stuff. And one of the things I've learned is, you know, you, you can look at the leaves of a plant to kind of tell what's going on in its life, what nourishment it gets, if it's flourishing or if it's not, if it needs water or not, if there's certain nutrients that it's missing, you can tell typically by looking at the leaves. But this is the point. If you want to change the plant, if you want it to thrive, you don't actually treat the leaves. You treat the roots. Because right? it's what's happening under the surface that's what's going to shape the life of a plant. If you want a plant to thrive, you water the soil. You give the nourishment in the soil because it's the roots that produce the life of the plant. You see what I'm saying? And the way that we change the soil, the roots, right, is by those routines, right? Regular water, regular nourishment, right? That's what, that's what changes who we are. I think, uh, do you guys understand what I'm trying to say? Yes. You guys get what I'm getting at? Yeah. Um, do you guys remember Mr. Miyagi? Do you remember Mr. Miyagi? Yeah. Mr. Miyagi? Karate Kid? Okay, Karate Kid was like the greatest movie ever, okay? It was the greatest movie ever. Now, Daniel LaRusso, you know, he gets beat, beat up by these other kids, you know, and he wants to learn karate. Remember this? The art of the open hand. Right? Right? 
So he sees Mr. Miyagi, and Mr. Miyagi has the skills to pay the bills, doesn't he? Right? He's got the karate skills. And Daniel LaRusso wants to be able to do that stuff. And you know, in his mind, he's imagining himself being able to do all these awesome things as a, as a karate warrior, right? You follow me here? Being able to do amazing things. And so he's like, he's like Mr. Miyagi, teach me. Teach me how to be a karate master, right? Do you remember what Mr. Miyagi does to teach him? He gives him routines, right? Wax on, wax off. Paint the fence, sand the floor, right? And this stuff isn't, this isn't sexy stuff, right? So Daniel LaRusso gets ticked, right? Do you remember this in the movie? He gets real ticked and he goes to Mr. Miyagi. He's like, I'm tired of doing all this stuff for you. I actually want to learn karate. I want to actually do it. And all you're doing is making me work for you. And he goes, Daniel's on. Stand there. Wax on, wax off. And he's like, mm -hmm. right, you follow me? And he goes, no. I look here. Wax on, wax off. And he begins to wax on, right? Remember this? Right? And he goes, Hah! right? And then all of a sudden, Daniel LaRusso starts to get the skills to pay the bills. You follow me? Right? And do you remember the last moment in the film, right? When he gets the great swan, the swan pose, right? Do you remember this? I wanted to do this. I don't know, every kid in the 80s went out in their backyard and they did this, right? You follow me? Because I want, but this is the thing, I would never be able to do it. And the reason why I would never be able to do it is because I had no one there in my life to say, Tanya's on, wax on. Wax off, right? I did not have the routine to become what I needed to become, to be able to do those things. And I have to say, I mean, I, I really have to blame some of the way in which our spiritual life has been hampered on preachers like myself. Because what we have often taught is that a life of the Spirit is all about it's all about enthusiasm. It's all about passion. It's all about having strong beliefs and strong feelings and go out there and live a life where you're wild at heart. But the truth of it is, is our feelings come and go and our passions come and go. It's the routines. It's the roots that make us who we are. You follow me here? Every morning I, I wake up and I kiss my wife and I say, I love you. And there are days when I feel it more than others. But I'm really glad that I have that routine. And no matter how I feel at that moment, I tell her I love you and I kiss her. And I can guarantee you that is going to matter more than the passing feelings and passions and thoughts. It's routines that make us who we are. See? It's routines that make us who we are. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the fact that maybe you've been here today, whether you feel it or not, whether you walk out of this room feeling like, oh man, I was touched by the spirit or not. I mean, sure that stuff's great. But you know what you are doing here? Walks on, walks off. Sound of law. Right? So that we become something that we're not. That over time, right, that our roots go deep. And we bear fruit because of our roots. Right? Because of our roots. This isn't a Father's Day sermon, but I would like to end by, by talking about my dad. Because my dad, uh, I don't know, my, my dad did it right, you know. My dad did it right. Not because, uh, you know, he did everything right. No. But he had an he had, he had indelible imp imprint, impact on me. And it wasn't because our relationship was always the greatest. I mean, I argued with him all the time. I was the worst. 
I really was. I mean, all, all throughout my high school years, I fought with him every day because I was stubborn and I liked to fight and I liked to hear myself talk. So I would argue with him about everything. I would argue with him about what I could do, where I could go, who my friends could be, what music I could listen to, what movies I could watch, you know, all that stuff. And then even when I went off to college, you know, the Lord changed my life and I, I felt the calling to go into ministry. It didn't mean I stopped to argue with my dad. I would go home every summer and I would argue with him all summer long about the Bible and about God, about politics. I just, I mean, I argued with him for years. Yeah. But you know what? That's an interesting kind of thing going on there. All right. Um, you know what? I would have to say this. None of that really, in the end of the day, mattered. What mattered was that I watched my dad year after year say, kids, go to church today. And I protested, and I argued. I don't have to be there. I could, I could go to... Go, go for a walk in the woods. I remember this argument. I could be close to God in the woods. I feel closer to God in the woods than I do in that church building. Maybe, Wes, but it's not about your feelings. Get in the car. It's not about our feelings. He's right. Ultimately, when it really comes down to it, it's not about our feelings. It's about who we are. And so I, I, I really do. I want to honor my dad in that. And I also want to honor our Heavenly Father because He's the same way. Scriptures say He's faithful. That means He doesn't change. You and I waver, we fluctuate. The Lord's mercy and grace is steadfast. It doesn't change. And as we begin to share more and more in His life and our roots are more and more growing deeper into the Spirit, we become stable. We become less changeable. We become strong. So let's, let's, let's take this time as we begin to go into worship, just honoring him for that, for his fidelity, for his steadfastness, for the fact that he doesn't change. Can you go ahead and stand with me? Lord Jesus, I, wanna, I just want to honor you right now. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday and today and forever. Father God, I wanna, I wanna honor you for having a love and, and, a, and, a, and a character that doesn't change. Holy Spirit, I wanna ask that you work in our lives in such a way that we can share in that, that we can become the kind of people that don't waver, not cast back and forth with every wind of change, every cultural trend. We am rooted and strong. Help us to become like you, fixed and firm with roots that go deep, that branches that climb high and fruit, Lord, fruit that is the glory of your life for others. If this is your prayer, can you say amen with me?